Awakened is my podcast by Vamir Ambartsumian, and I'm really excited to have gotten this started. Finally, I've been meaning to do a podcast for quite a while, and I decided that this intersection between AI and spirituality is extremely fascinating, and I wanted to just dive into whatever subjects I like. Uh, it should be natural and organic, um, whoever comes up as interesting, and hopefully this stimulates some beautiful discussions. This particular recording, Awakened One, being the first episode, was recorded on May 9th, 2022, and thankfully we have it rolling out for you. And so our guest for this recording is Peter Scott, and of course he's had some updates as any remarkable person is always working so i will just introduce him as peter scott is a futurist coach and technology expert helping people master technological disruption after receiving a master's degree in computer science from cambridge university he moved to california to work for nasa's jet propulsion lab wow and has continued to do that to this day he raises awareness about artificial intelligence. He's appeared on radio, TV, given university courses, and uh, innumerable appearances to diverse audiences in several countries. So, a cosmopolitan. He spoke at parliamentary groups um, and delivered a TED Talk to a thousand people in British Columbia. His podcast, Artificial Intelligence in You, has over a hundred episodes, and every week tackles three questions. What is AI? Why will it affect you? How do you and your business survive and thrive during the AI revolution? And dives pretty deeply. In my experience, um, he really engages the guest and wants to pull out every drop of valuable knowledge and juice out of the guest. And he, he really wants to create quality. So I was thankful that my colleague Richard Foster Fletcher connected me with him and he was very gracious. I think probably what I was most impressed by Peter, aside from all his accolades, is his grace. His new book, Artificial Intelligence and You, with the same name as his podcast, uh, covers the same questions and is now out for purchase. He founded the Next Wave Institute, an international educational organization teaching how to understand and leverage AI to thrive through technological disruption. And if you're curious about the TED Talk, you can go on his website or LinkedIn, uh, humancusp.com. And the parliamentary group was the Britain's House of Lords, uh, talking about the future of AI, and I'm sure... As this comes out, he's rolling out new things every week and doing beautiful things for the future of AI. He lives on Vancouver Island and is a skydiver and certified scuba diver. So, you know, just um, amazing guy. Very impressive. So I just wanted to say very quickly, um, thank you all for listening. Uh, enjoy the journey and let's see where this goes. Welcome to the podcast. My name is Vamir Amartsumian, and today we have the one and only Peter Scott. Peter, welcome. Hey, it's a pleasure to be here. And where do you hail from? Originally from England, southeast Essex, and then spent a third of my life in the United States, in California, and since then, the uh, most recent third has been in British Columbia. Wow, wonderful. I am from New Jersey, living in New Jersey, everybody's favorite state, pretty simple. So, pleasure to connect with you. The Garden State. The Garden State. Um, luckily enough, it's bright and shiny out. It's uh, once in a while it comes about, so very nice. So, I feel like we have a plethora of topics to talk about. Um, I wanted to start, I was really intrigued by one quote that stood out. We can kind of dig into the dessert before dinner if you like. Um, I, I noticed in your TEDx talk, you said uh, utopia has to be earned. 
And um, I really liked that. And I felt uh, the first question I had was uh, kind of about your view on utopia. Um, it, it could be easy, it might not be easy, it might be more intricate. How do you view your utopia? What does it look like? You know, it, it's got uh, a lot of, uh, of thinking behind uh, utopia because it's something that we always aim for, but it's like the dog chasing the car. They don't know what to do with it if they catch up with it. If they, if they catch the car, if we ever did have a, a utopia, what would we do with it? Because all the popular narratives, the fiction that we have around utopia suggests that either it's a bad idea to begin with and that someone's going to get a, a raw deal out of it, uh, or that it will never last very long and will ultimately propel us into something worse. And of course, you don't get good fiction unless you've got a conflict to begin with. Um, but it, it it still suggests the sort of conversation that you find happening a lot now in artificial intelligence uh, existential risk circles about, well, would we end up in a wall-e kind of scenario is maybe the best sort of outcome where we're all sitting around in lounges watching movies while the AIs take care of everything. And and so it it then it brings in the value alignment problem from AI. Uh, what are our values? How do we get AI to align with them? And if we have a super intelligence that's capable of uh, or effectively unlimited power, what should it do to exercise that? Uh, we don't really examine our values because historically we've never gotten everything that we wanted. But personally, my idea of utopia, and I don't know how well it would stand up to a ruthless examination, is something like Star Trek, where we've taken care of the problems that we have now, and then we uh, use our uh, we, we challenge ourselves by going out into the universe and discovering more. Right. I mean, not to get too uh, abstract too quickly, but I wonder, I was watching this um, monk try to describe enlightenment because when he was so, he was so dissatisfied at a young age, um, hearing the answers, oh, it's this ephemeral thing, you know it when you feel it, it's beyond the beyond. And he gave this um, anecdote, which is rather long, but basically there's three children who have a chance to have three wishes. And um, I'm sorry, they have one wish each. And they have to outdo each other. Whoever has the best wish wins. So the first kid asks for you know, um, the newest video game every time it comes out. Second kid asks for a video game store because then he can get all of the video games he wants. And then the third kid asks for a billion dollars so that he can buy a video game store and have all the games he wants and all the other things he wants, etc. And it kind of keeps continuing down this line of thinking. And eventually the, the answer is, um, you know, three wishes, then unlimited wishes. And then the last kid says, I wish I could be so happy, so content that I don't want to wish for anything anymore. And he won the game. And I thought to myself, we seem to be, and this reminds me of uh, Yuval Noah Harari's book um, at the end where he's saying, you know, um, what, do, what do we want? What do super intelligences really want? And do you feel like the value alignment problem um, is mostly weighed on what we want? Uh, not being able to figure that out, kind of like the uh, donkey chasing the carrot. Um, do you think that if everybody sort of reached enlightenment or became a bit more um, centered, then we wouldn't have to uh, go through such a debate so furiously? I got to say that when I asked my youngest daughter, uh, younger daughter, about the wishes problem and, and said, you've, you've got a genie, and but you only got three wishes, so what are you going to wish for? She said, and I thought she was going to say, wish for more wishes, and I would say, no, you can't do that. Right. Uh, but she said, I would wish for more genies, which mm. I've not heard before, but that's pretty good. Also got some intersection with AI. I yeah. would like to 
say that I would define humanity as being in the space of wanting things, of of having something to explore so that if we were in a space of not um, wanting to wish for anything else, yeah. then I uh, I haven't examined that space very closely, but I am because I'm not a philosopher. Uh, but it doesn't sound like the, the place that I'd want to be. The value alignment problem at the moment in AI is oriented all around preventing bad outcomes. Right. And uh, and it's very easy to see how you can get a bad outcome with an AI that is super powerful, super intelligent, and and is hanging on our every word um, and and taking us literally. Uh, there's just countless examples of that, starting with the paperclip scenario, of course, and um, and and so. Uh, Taking care of just having it not create a super bad outcome is pretty much where everyone's thinking is at the moment and not on how can we make it be um, less or, or less bad or or closer to to better. And, and in, in fiction and my podcast, we've had some science fiction authors on where we, we, we talk about this there. Uh, some science fiction authors like Isaac Asimov, David Brin have thought about this uh, a fair bit. And some of the outcomes are that the AI decides that the best thing it can do for us is leave us alone. <laughs> right, it's true. There was the one scenario of um, what if we build a super intelligent machine and it turns itself off? You know? <laughs> right. So. right. Or, or it manipulates things from behind the scenes. That was one of Asimov's tropes. Right. And because if it is discovered, then its goals don't work. Absolutely. Um, so it seems like on the scale of errors, we're trying to, um, uniquely in this scenario, it seems like we're trying to avoid catastrophic failure and kind of move towards neutrality. Um, it seems like optimistic at best to get a really beneficial, benevolent, kind of a wise man or a guru super intelligence. But um, we can kind of hope for like a calculator like system um, that's kind of without prejudice. Um, do you feel that um, do you feel the weight of the uh, current debate between like near term and long term issues? I think there's been a lot of kind of um, tumbling around that, you know, where there's a lot of people that say those issues are way too far off. And we'll get into the time scale. I hope that it would be a really interesting discussion. I enjoyed what you said with uh, Stuart Russell on that. Uh, it's a very fascinating discussion. Um, but do you think the squabbling is unnecessary, or do you think it's um, maybe a non-issue uh, that we need to focus on the ethical issues of today, what's happening and affecting people today, or do you think a focus on long-term issues might be um, like a meta solution to the near-term issues? Well, I was going to say squabbling is what we do, right? But <laughs> Socratic dialogue is what we do. And the communication that comes out of our mouth is so limited with respect to what we're trying to convey that you've got to go through some iterations to get anything right. Uh, and I do feel that there is a lot of um, people talking past each other at the moment about different timelines, which you said we'll get into. and. And, and so in the near term, you've got AI with tremendous benefits. Um, and the the downsides are debatable. They are large in some respect, but they are things like uh, automation of jobs and how do we handle the flow of capital. They're not in the existential risk category. And then you've got people who like to think about philosophy. And someone like Nick Bostrom, who is a philosopher, not a computer scientist, wrote Superintelligence. And his thesis was, look, I, I don't know if a superintelligence is possible. I have no idea how we would create one or when it would be possible. But I just want to think about what would happen if we had one. And decided that after that investigation, it was mostly bad and it was worth talking about 
Now, this could be further off than the worst consequences of climate change. But the thing is, with climate change, we can kind of measure it. We can plot it on a graph and say, at this point, it's going to be this bad. Uh, whereas with this, it's more like a roll of the dice. We don't know how far off some of these existential issues are, but some people think, well, let's work on thinking about that now, like Bostrom, that's his contribution. Let's, let's start the the conversation. Right. And some of the problems are that, um, you know, your fate might be sealed, uh, you know, it might be too late uh, instead of like some issues where you kind of, as you go, you figure out the solutions. It seems that this is one that has to be uh, precautionary or anticipatory. Um, do you agree? Do you feel that way? Yes. Uh, and the precautionary principle yes. is, is one that you can you can kind of invoke here. The, the precautionary principle says that if something has a small chance of happening but a large consequence, then you should pay attention to it in roughly the same proportion as something with a, a larger chance of happening, but a smaller consequence. So take, for instance, an asteroid impact. Yes. It turns out that your chance of dying in an asteroid impact is about the same as your chance of dying in a commercial plane accident, which sounds wrong because we don't know anyone that's died in an asteroid impact. But uh, if you multiply the numbers out, an asteroid impact happens about once every 50 million years, and when it does, would kill all of us mm -hmm. on that scale. That would be, say, 10 billion people. Well, on average, that's 200 people a year, which is the same as a uh, commercial plane crash, which doesn't do you much good, except if you're trying to decide how much should you spend on mitigating asteroid impacts. And it ought to be about the same as you spend on uh, preventing plane accidents. And I haven't compared those numbers. I don't know how much we spend on on each of those things, but we are doing something about asteroid impacts. And right. we obviously have things like the NTSB and the FAA working on, on plane crashes. So, but you can't apply the precautionary principle to something whose probability you can't estimate. So we have only guesses as to what the chances are of super intelligence, super powerful uh, AI manifesting on on what sort of time scale, and, uh, and and we can guess at the consequences. We can we can work some of those out. We have no idea how likely that is to happen. So you you have have problems applying the precautionary principle. Right, and I think uh, Bostrom said in uh, hyperbolic fashion. Um, he said, even if we reduce uh, humanity's existential risk by one billion of one billionth percent, um, it's worth putting uh, billions and billions of dollars into the funding. So I thought that was rather interesting um, because it seems like if you take that uh, same um, same principle, let's say, uh, then you would just look at. Uh, okay, existential risks, you could say, are ones that can wipe out all of humanity. So it's the same number across. Um, but which ones are more likely and which ones are near term and farther term? So you could say, you know, we have to prioritize those. But this is kind of a magic box one. You know, it could pop up in 2050. Um, it could pop up after, I think you said, 100 Nobel Prizes. Um, who knows? So... I'm very curious, maybe this transitions nicely into the time scale. Um, some people say that the time scale doesn't matter. Uh, the reason being that, um, you know, even if it were uh, far away, it takes a lot of time to develop these uh, safety mechanisms and to solve these ridiculously hard problems like the control problem and the value alignment problem. So there's no advantage to having a delay. Um, and then you can kind of dive into the the funding part. Uh, do you feel that the time scale matters? Um, I, I have an intuition that you do, but um, that how on what metrics do it, does it affect our conversation? If it matters and if it doesn't matter, um, obviously, if it's knocking on our door tomorrow, we have a different uh, conversation. But I'm just curious if you think that's a you know 
high value variable? Clearly, the time scale matters because we have an intuition, most people have an intuition that it's going to happen not in thousands of years, but but decades. It's just an intuition. And, and, and it sorry, assumes that, and this is under the assumption that it will happen. I mean, the only thing that uh, would make it impossible is if um, the technology itself were impossible, which I think mostly is ruled out. And then if we don't destroy ourselves in the process. So those two not happening means that it's going to eventually happen if humanity uh, progresses. It also has the principle of uh, we choose to progress too, which is seems inevitable. Right. There are, are no natural breaks on this and there's no fundamental scientific reason it, it can't happen. So it 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 will happen. And and in this co in this conversation, you really have to listen to the 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 people that are, are speaking on different sides here who will hear this because a whole lot of people will be saying uh, as one person who interviewed me did that there is a downside to pointing out this risk which is that people will stop developing ai that it will have provably beneficial effects mm. this is an ai a technology that is capable of curing cancer of ending disease or aging or death uh, probably long before it presents those other risks and if <laughs> Yeah. If if we treat this uh, discussion about the existential risk uh, as though it is just speculation that we're entitled to do, we perhaps ignore some of the effects that it will have on. Uh, is is it going to chill any of that sort of development? I don't think personally that we can get to the point where, well, we're certainly not anywhere close to the point where it's having any sort of chilling effect. We're also not close to the point where yeah. It's having any kind of effect of um, ach achieving any results. We have a, a lot of people thinking about it, but I, I don't know what sort of progress there is. So, so you do have to listen to and respect the that view and say, well, this is not something that can be um, stopped, uh, nor should we we try to stop the development of AI uh, that will result in this. But we've we, we've clearly got to apply some thinking to this 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 kind of outcome. And I, you know, that that is uh, something of a dichotomy, but then there's also the reality that uh, as many people as are thinking about this at, at the moment, it's not having uh, it's not nowhere close to a level that will actually change the the needle uh, of of how this this work is being done only some catastrophic event you have to look to something like science fiction and the dune series of books where they had a proscription against creating a machine in the image of a human mind it was um instantiated, uh, 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 enshrined in this religious catechism that had clearly been the, the, the result of a near-death experience for the whole race in, in doing that. Uh, and of course, Herbert realized that if you did have machines that advanced, you'd have a whole different story and not the one he wanted to tell. So uh, that's, that, that's one of the reasons that that was in there, but only that sort of <laughs> huge event could could get us to the the place where we would even say let's take whatever action it it, it would take to stop developing ai that is is simply not on on the cards right. that's just not um that the, the, the likelihood of something like that is happening um is just too small right i agree um you know, when trains first were invented, um, people were campaigning about how our souls will be left behind in transit, that uh, trains are too fast for our souls. Um, but I don't think this is uh, 
an example of Ludditism. Um, I think it's at least the more sophisticated individuals such as yourself in this field, it seems like the view is um, we need to take extreme caution. You know, like this is a very delicate um, transformation uh, for humanity. But do you, uh, I'm getting the sense, do you feel that the technologies we have today are not as impressive enough to be worried about? Well, today's technology is certainly nowhere. In, Comparatively, to, of course. But yes. how, how do you feel to, about their... Um, and, and that's where a lot of the people in the field, the practitioners of AI, will say, look, you're worried about something you clearly don't understand. I have uh, this difficulty in getting my network to do anything. It's not right. going to suddenly wake up and and... and and, and take over the world. There's a meme about that. It's leveraging the um, one of the left panel of a picture of the two women, well, one woman screaming hysterically, another one holding her back. Mm -hmm. um, and and the, the caption mm -hmm. to that one is people worrying about AI taking over the world. And then the, the right one is, a cat. <clears throat> is, is the cat. Um, and the caption is my neural network. And there's a tag bounding box around the cat that says dog. <laughs> um, and and uh, it actually brought that up to Roman Jampolsky, who's a uh, computer science professor. Fantastic and, uh, person. Computer security. Yep. And uh, AI safety uh, in, invented the field or, and named it. And he said, this is a perfect example of why we need to be concerned about AI safety. You have an AI that had one job and it got it wrong. And so what's the consequences of labeling a cat as a dog? And, and that's, I think, a, a, a good example that we we can get distracted perhaps by the existential threat. I'd like to say I want to leave those conversations until the, the last thing we talk about because they, 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 they're like the black hole of, of thinking. They, they suck everything into them. Um, because they are so final uh, and yet there is a spectrum and uh, a, a gradient of AI benefits and risks uh, starting right now with issues like privacy and bias um, that goes quite smoothly in, in my perception, increasing in both benefit and risk, the more capable that it gets. And I, I think that when we focus on just what's happening today or just what could happen when we get to that uh, point of superintelligence. We may be ignoring too much some of the things that could be happening in five years. Right. Absolutely. What do you think is going to happen in five years? Well, uh, of course, it's speculative based on what we we get in in terms of advances towards artificial general intelligence, there are things happening now that exceed what I thought were possible. were possible a couple of years ago. The new models in GPT-3 that are simply doing a really good job of impersonating understanding. And, and, and it good does Chinese make rooms. me wonder... Yes, it, it makes me wonder how uh, much that those are, are capable of doing that we haven't given enough enough thought to, and 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 now some of the thinking is going off in uh, really interesting directions and saying, well, it's not necessarily about increasing the number of parameters in a transformer to make it more capable, but they're being creative and inventive in in other directions. So clearly one of the things that we've had some conversation about is the potential for automation on jobs. But uh, I don't think we've fine-tuned the thinking about which jobs and how that would apply to. The uh, biggest, I think, study that was done of this, the Oxford Martin Program for the Future of Employment and the Fry and Osborne study looked at hundreds of job classifications and the potential for automation, but it was done by studying how much they 
involved repetitive acts, either uh, cognitive actions or uh, physical actions. So on the basis of that, they concluded that uh, point of sale retail clerks were at high risk of automation because they do the same thing all the time, like in a clothing store, folding T-shirts and putting them up on hangers all day. Right. Um, but that is something it is phenomenally hard uh, to automate right. with the machine right now. And we don't know what questions to ask to even do that uh, uh, automated at the moment. So the idea that that is in danger of being 90% automated in the next 12 years is unrealistic. But then I think there are other jobs that are far more realistic, like um, a, a large proportion of what CEOs do. Right. Accounting, um, yes. law, you know. Um, What's and yeah, of course. I mean, CEOs making executive decisions, weighing the um, weighing the variables, and there are very few decisions comparatively to other tiers of the hierarchy in the company. That's that's definitely uh, interesting to explore. An AI CEO, um, and not that we need to perhaps worry too much about the job security of CEOs. Right. In, in general, in, in in the United States, um, but there is, I think, considerable potential for automating um, a lot of what happens in the C-suite because of the amount of round trips that involves in human communication. You know, the the CEO has a conversation with director of marketing, and then they wait for a report from uh, operations director, and then they have another meeting to talk about. Uh, design and 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 then they involve HR and all of these things involve waiting for someone to become available, uh, having a conversation, and then passing it on to someone else. And, and typically, even the fastest of those kind of decision cycles is, takes days. But there is a lot of pattern. In matching and finding kind of um, activity in that, that neural networks could be uh, very well trained to do. And if we figure that out, the possibility of those being executed in seconds it could confer enormous competitive advantage to any business that figures out how to make that work. Right. Yeah, no, it makes sense. Um... And interestingly enough, I mean, you look at what jobs are getting replaced in the medium term, it seems that they're white collar jobs. You know, I feel that uh, plumbing is going to be a lot harder to replace, you know, than what we've mentioned. Um, so do you think a big crux of this is robotics? Do you feel that, for example, with the folding clothes, um, it seems like this software would be designable it's just that getting the the machine to do it in the real world environment correctly without kind of bumping into customers and you know dropping and smashing things and do you feel that robotics is the crux of these kind of um lower cognitive difficulty tasks anything that involves physical contact with the outside world is a, a really hard problem Stuart russell uh, has a a quote for that. Uh, he says, put crudely, the world is an extremely large problem space. <laughs> Just the act of putting on t-shirt in the morning is phenomenally difficult to even think about how you would get a robot to do it. And particularly since most of our approaches in that respect now, if not all of them, involve machine vision. Looking at this thing, well, right. Close your eyes, put the T-shirt on, see how much difference the the vision is making. It's um, based on at least ninety percent of it is is knowing how a T-shirt behaves and um, predicting what will happen uh, when you engage it, when you you start holding it and and uh, pushing around it with your your fingers. Now, that involves a lot of sensory bandwidth and using nerve endings that 
you have in your fingers, uh, all the way up your arm, the rest of your body, and continually cycling through uh, uh, predictions of what this should feel like and how that differs from what you are feeling. And, and the state of the research and development into things like that is at uh, relatively primitive levels. I mean, it's a very hard problem. So anything that's being done, everything that's happening in that space right now is is advanced and leading edge and 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 yet compared to what we have available uh, as, as humans, how we solve that is is so far behind. And and so for that reason, as you said, I think that knowledge work is the area where we will see the most kind of impact in the next five to 10 years from AI. Yeah. I remember Elon Musk was saying he was having some difficulties uh, automating his manufacturing. Like, for example, there's like a, a tube that you have to kind of get into, you know, connect the tube. And he said... Programming that is nearly impossible, but you just have a human and they just go whoop and that's done. You know, um, I'm curious though, a lot of people make this false uh, leap to AI risk, saying, Oh, well, AI doesn't have a body and so it can't hurt us. You know, there's no Terminator like thing walking around and so, uh, you know, it needs a body to be like us, to interact in the world and therefore harm us. Um, but that seems kind of like too easy to break down. Um, do you agree? Do you think it's just a misunderstanding of how the modern world works? You know, you look at AI and um, it could just kind of plug into the internet and do anything that, and outsourcing right. pretty much. Well, um, if we're talking about existential threats from disembodied AIs, then yes, this one is disposed of pretty easily. Just acknowledging that we're going into that area there that um, <laughs> has that sort of philosophical uh, gravitational pull, but uh, an AI that would get into the power grid would would cause catastrophic problems. And uh, the idea that it needs to have a, a body is is just not to to do damage is is just not there. And while I'm here, let's just take care of the idea that you could just turn it off. Right. <laughs> That, Please, <laughs> and that was um, th that was one Neil deGrasse Tyson actually uh, used to say. And then, to his great credit, uh, someone explained it to him. He understood it, and then he said, "I was wrong." Um, and, yeah, and, and so, right, right now, for instance, if you thought about what would it take to turn off Siri or other devices with that that kind of uh, footprint, could you turn that off? And the answer would be not without probably turning off every server that Apple has because it's not in one place. It's it's all over. Many, many data centers. It, it's got to be distributed in, in order to be reliable. And so now if you had an AI that had the, the capability of... of relocating itself elsewhere, which is just a basic sort of primitive for uh, viral worms, something like Stuxnet, that was, they're all designed to do that. So it, it's not hard. Then a, an AI that was dangerous could conceivably be on any networked device anywhere in the world or all of them. So what are you going to do? Turn off every computer in the world? Even if you think you could do that, um, you know, what are the consequences? So the, the if you had a malevolent or otherwise dangerous, let, let alone hostile AI um, with that level of capability, turning it off is, is just not possible. Right. That kind of strikes it out. Um, also, I mean, disembodied AI includes autonomous weapons. Um, I think. I no, I think they're embodied in the weapons. Uh, okay. They don't have a whole lot of contact with the world, but they are sensing it. Okay. I'm curious if you have any um, updated thoughts on autonomous weapons. Um, I remember your discussion with, um, you know, regarding slaughter bots, 
and how um, you know uh, one kind of proposal that emerged from that was a treaty, and the the descending into the particulars would be rather hard for that. But you know what a global solution for um, autonomous weapons might be. Uh, mm. There's there's a lot of I mean, it seems to be on the side of what we mentioned, like big catastrophic risk. Um, though it it does seem uh, one of those problems that we can solve on the humanity side. You know, we can align with those our own. We can make our own value alignment and then make the decision with that. Um, what do you What are your thoughts on that? Anything new? I am impressed by the work that's being done on this by uh, people like Peter Asaro, uh, uh, campaign against killer robots uh, and uh, or, uh, against uh, lethal autonomous weapons. And it, I think, illustrates one of the dichotomies we were talking about earlier in that the uh, short term and immediate application of uh, autonomous weapons is actually making uh, war less lethal in that if you can apply some intelligence to what or who you're attacking, then you can reduce collateral damage. Uh, and, and like smart weapons, you hit the one building that you want to and not you know, 10 or 15 buildings around it. Right. The, uh, and, and so that's a, a lot of the impetus for making weapons smarter. And and, and and yet the thinking from the the people that are, are saying this is that this needs some limitation is that it it makes war too easy. Uh, it makes <laughs> the uh, development of technology that could be subverted, used for other things, and become ubiquitous and now uh, used by people uh, more casually. It, may, it raises that possibility that you're opening this this Pandora's box. It's a um, I, I, I I'm not uh, I think central enough to that debate at the moment to uh, to to pick up on uh, any more of the nuances of it. I'm uh, aware that. It's it's not as simplistic a debate as many people seem to think uh, on either side. Right. I mean, um, it seems like the extremist view is, uh, you know, love is the answer, no more war. I mean, that would be very simple if we could just do that, right? If we could just not develop any autonomous weapons. It's the ideal. But it seems like we have to be, uh, one of my least favorite words, realistic um, in that in that situation, so I'm definitely curious about the the particulars of that issue because it's going to affect a lot of our policy. So something to explore. Um, it's interesting that, that it hasn't been used more prominently in the uh, Ukraine war, right. I think. And I, I, um, yeah, I would have expected to see a little bit more, but I, I think Russia. Does have something of a tendency to uh, fight? Well, we all do to fight the last war and uh, to use the technology that it's most familiar with in uh, a ground war. Uh, Ukraine has been a bit more inventive and so has made more use of drones. And um, and, and Russia has done some cyber operations, but otherwise, it's it, it's remarkably, I think, old school technology. Do you think that they might be uh, holding back? Uh, like they're not kind of putting all their guns forward, uh, metaphorically, you know, just so how we have uh, nuclear weapons, but that's not in front of the front line. No, I don't think there's any reason for either side to hold back on on, on anything. Interesting. Yeah, you, you're right. It does seem remarkably old school. Um, uh, one thing you mentioned is um, it being used, and I, I thought I was thinking there was a there was a theory, and I, I know a few individuals who are developing um, their 
corner of AGI, and they are highly interested in making it open source, you know, free and accessible to all. And this kind of has its uh, column of pros and cons. And I'm curious to say uh, to see how um, you view this. Uh, you know, of course, a, a terrorist group can fork it and kind of develop their own weaponized technology. Um, do you feel that an open source AGI is one of those things that have more benefits than risks? Or do you feel that, I feel like the other side of the spectrum is Bostrom's proposal to kind of develop AI with a bunch of um, genius nerds, uh, you know, um, supervised under the guise of the UN Assembly uh, in a private room um, and to ban it being developed anywhere else. Where do you see on those two sides, you know, completely open source, completely private, uh, where do you see that AGI can be developed? Uh, I was around at the uh, birth of the open source movement and uh, in a, a lot of the, um, the, the the places where that was being developed and uh, that the philosophy, the approach and uh, debated and, and discussed uh, at the very first open source conference, for instance. So I think that the issues are, and debates around open source apply very much here. Uh, it took back then a long time for businesses to, to come around to the idea that open source was beneficial to them. But this was something that was realized by the grassroots, grassroots hackers uh, early on that they could get work done faster, the more that it was shared with other people. And, and of course, private enterprise thought, well, we're giving away our intellectual property if right. we do that. But they came to realize that the intellectual property in the form of code was not as valuable as the things that they could do with that code, uh, which would be accelerated and magnified the faster that code was improved. And so you had and then that led to things like, more recently, Google open sourcing, uh, open sourcing TensorFlow, right, and uh, OpenAI open sourcing GPT three. So the the um, principal uh, benefit uh, to a, a company, uh, their unique uh, proposition, their un unique selling value, is now in something like the execution of a GPT-3 uh, <clears throat> and the amount of computing hardware that they have to put. But the ideas uh, are ones that the, the, the people in the field just are naturally impelled to share in the open source ethos now is, is so universal that you're just not going to turn that back except in places like national security. Right. And I'm curious, um, of kind of this accelerating ramp of innovation, you know, open source is an example of this. Um, collaboration, lack of regulation. Do you see any? Um, do you see any bumpers uh, on either side that might need to be in place that might be effective, or if any? I mean, um, it seems like the United States historically has this kind of light touch approach for innovation, and you can see globally it's different. Uh, I'm very curious, like, what you think should be in place, if anything. Mm. Well, I was having an uh, interesting discussion about that with with uh, some of my guests, and um, because there's the perception, the reality that the field of computer science doesn't have a, the same kind of uh, controls on its uh, industrial safety uh, as a, a lot of physical disciplines. So if you compare failure rates of software with things like elevators and airplanes, right. they've got a lot of infrastructure around making sure that you can't screw up. And and you can look at things like the debate about why don't we do online voting to find out because the people in the field of software will say, no, it's just too easy to hack. 
so I have talked to people who say they foresee that for AI and the potential of it being um, subverted or for the potential for it failing and what that could could cause in effects that we will need some um, more kind of industrial safety sort of protocols around this certifications for people certifications for software sort of like a good housekeeping seal of approval where you can put software through a third party evaluation process that will evaluate its its safety and in integrity that's a very really hard thing to imagine yeah as a a developer uh, which is why it hasn't happened now uh, talk to any developer about the the testing protocols how hard those are but uh, their thinking is that there will be pressure to to bring about things like this and uh, more pressure for certification which again is a thing that the development community community is uh, generally viscerally a, a opposed to that there should be a, a certification necessary to get into that field and and they like to point out the problems uh, why why certifications miss the mark but uh, i i don't know whether this will happen because i think it's got more to do with social pressures and uh, organizational ones than than technical ones but it's an interesting line of thinking yeah and i i was going to ask about this kind of multivariate um approach you know if you look at uh what happened with recombinant dna um you know there was kind of a scientific consensus on what was going on and i feel that well, i mean feel free to disagree it feels like it has to generate from your belief system like you have to want ai to be a certain way for it to go through your development through policy things like that you know it seems like if everybody is let's say again value aligned then it seems a bit easier to impose regulations and policies and that seems to be that you know the scientific consensus gelling is what we need the most um do you agree with that do you think that is the base um so are you are you saying that if there are people who believe that they can get a, a competitive advantage from for their organizations by ignoring safety protocols then they will do that i think that um it depends what your lens it's kind of like you know ai has goal directed behavior you ask it to get a cup of coffee, it kills everything in the way to get the cup of coffee. Like we might have our own goal directed behavior like power or you know development and whatever gets in the way, we just stop that. I think it's more of do you feel that in this seemingly fragmented community of AI, do you feel that uh, you know it's like geopolitically fragmented, you know, presentist, futurist fragmented, you know, the list goes on. Do you feel that um, getting a consensus will be possible and effective in this field? Or do you think there's, I mean, there's always going to be phrase, but do you think the general consensus is possible here? And if not, what's so unique about AI that makes it so difficult um, to get kind of the same um, agreement as, let's say, climate change? Well, I, I think it's, the, the same problem as computer science, only just maybe accelerated some, that there's a, a spectrum ranging from the, com, the pure computer science, like in university, all the way over to uh, the applied computer science where you've got embedded devices and uh, things like computer uh, devices in hospitals where they've got to work or someone dies. Right. And and so you get more controls the more you move along that spectrum. When I'm taking, I was taking computer science classes, they would present an algorithm without putting any of the checks and balances in that it would have in practice because they would just get in the way of understanding the uh, implementation of it, uh, what it was doing. But in in practice, you would put all kinds of exception handlers around it to catch those potential problems. So yeah. I, I, as AI becomes 
more applied in situations where there is a lot of um, human safety at stake. And <clears throat> I'm thinking in particular about decisions that affect people's lives. Like, do you get a loan? Uh, do you get right. to go to this school? Um, what's the value we give to your insurance claim? Those are, are things where our tort system will push back on the kind of free ranging um, break, uh, move fast and break stuff <laughs> culture uh, and, and rein it in. And, and so there'll be this, this sort of point where one of these um, forces meets the other one and, and it will shift over time. So the more AI gets out into that world, the more it's going to have to learn to live in it. Right. I mean, you can see a lot of outrage with the near-term AI issues, you know, like the uh, Compass system. I'm not sure if you're familiar. Yeah. Um, and many, many, many examples. I mean, there's entire organizations. Um, one of them being MKI, which I'm working with. Um, you know, they're working on uh, near-term AI issues and how to, you know, build digital trust and things like that. And um, it, it seems it seems good. It seems that we're kind of pushing back on. Hey, this is giving us some real bias here. Hey, this is, and we're attempting to nip it in the bud. Uh, do you think that uh, for these near-term issues we can kind of be reactive, or is this um, a complete overhaul we need? Like, I give this analogy, um, sort of like you know, nature made us randomly, and we, you know, through evolution, um, survival of the fittest, and then we're kind of creating this these machines consciously, and we're carrying all this baggage with our biases, our survival biases, our preferences, and things like that. But we're trying to create this kind of clean system, it feels, you know, making it on purpose rather than uh, randomly. And obviously, I'm curious to see what an AGI will create with its own kind of structure, you know, with its own kind of preferences. Um, but I'm curious, you know, how do we, um, how do we clean ourselves up, you know, uh, when it comes to these near-term issues? Um, are we going to just be reactive and kind of say, Oh, it's actually indirectly made us aware of this thing about us, you know? Or are we going to have to see where those known unknowns are and then just have to react to unknown unknowns? How do you feel about this? I was uh, attending virtually uh, last week a conference at the uh, Cambridge University uh, Center for the Study of Existential Risk. And Caesar. They, they, yes, Caesar. And they were making um, some points in some of the talks that we can foresee risk that as a society, we will just not um, take appropriate reaction to because we don't engage with it as a real thing from day to day. And some things like asteroid impact fall into right. that category and and, and Yet, I well, I think there's a we, we we've benefited from some cultural um, familiarity with that through movies that that then suggest maybe we should do something about this, but that the um, other risks, if they are not made real, then uh, you won't get traction when it's a, a matter of do I fund doing something about that? Or do I do something about inflation and jobs <clears throat> and the housing market and other things that are hurting people right now? And one of the speakers there who'd been in politics said, you just won't get elected or reelected if you go down that road. And uh, I, I, I think there's a, a big question that I would like to have seen explored there of what do you need for critical mass? Are you, you, hmm. Do you actually need enough people to uh, form a majority vote for uh, politicians? Um, clearly, they're suggesting that the number of people in the room there who obviously were all on board with uh, addressing existential risk wasn't enough. Uh, but then at what point in between 
is it adequate? Did that you can reach a pretty And uh, I I don't have an answer to that, but I I like the fact that AI is prompting this kind of conversation, which we wouldn't really have had 10, 15 years ago. Right. I mean, the the critical mass is probably a sequel to 2001, A Space Odyssey. Um, <laughs> it's possible. Um, I mean, part of the part of the pop culture uh, seems to have damaged uh, AI risk. Also, I mean, people say, "Oh, there's no Terminator." You know, there's. I mean, there's things like iRobot, which is based on Asimov's principles. But do you feel that the, you know, I mean, unfortunately, it seems like for the public, things have to kind of be in your face. Um, we saw during the pandemic, you would see numerous things. And before the pandemic, we saw numerous issues and news pop up, right? The border, um, you know, the Mexican border, that was a top issue. That's all we talked about. And then there was, um, I think, discrimination against Asian Americans um, and the Black Lives Matter movement. And as one popped up, it seemed to replace, you know, it seemed to one would go out of focus. And to, right now, I think uh, we're going through the abortion issue, and part of it's justified because some things require timely um, decisions, you know. But do you feel that we're in a paradoxical situation? I mean, um, it seems that the the likely outcome of AI safety, I mean, not the likely outcome, the optimistic outcome is invisibility. It's like, if we do it right, Nobody knows what we did. We just made everything safe. You don't really see the uh, the big asteroid hurtling towards us. So um, maybe it's something to explore. I mean, you said you don't have the answer, but um, how do you feel that we might make it uh, more sexy? I think we've got to ask ourselves, how many people do we need to be on board with this? Does it need to be on the front page of the newspaper every day before we get the kind of support that we need. One of the other points that was made at this conference was, look at the spending that's made on defense. Isn't that right. addressing the existential threat of an invasion, um, a, a, a conflict in, in the world somewhere? Well, it's uh, it, it's really addressing a threat that people are all too familiar with because they have so many examples through uh, history, past and recent, of uh, global conflicts, and so it's easy for them to imagine. Which is where I think that the uh, it became possible to fund uh, asteroid impact uh, remediation because we had movies to show us what hey. that would be like, uh, and books. It became something where people had this shared understanding of. Uh, global winter um, and and the like. Now, when the, the conversation about AI is all rooted in the Terminator, then it, it's not so helpful. The ones that are more thoughtful about that, um, you, you do have to wonder about whether you can get that conversation into the public sphere because maybe it just doesn't look sexy enough. And in, in the extreme, if you go out far enough, then there's just no contest. It's a very boring movie because <laughs> at, at, in, in, at one point everyone dies, and, and and but that's you know we can we can pull back and examine things that 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 happened before then. But I, I you know it's possible to address existential problems without needing everyone's involvement, agreement, or awareness. And, and and that ought to be the function of government. Um, it ought to be that we elect people and appoint people in government that are better at these things than we are, and we know that, and therefore we ought to be trusting their judgment more than our own on exactly the sort of long-term issue. Um, and yet when I say those words, in the United States at least, that sounds comical. Mm -hmm. And I think we lost sight of that. Um, and, and, and yet we could go back to something like World War II and Manhattan Project spending uh, equivalent of trillions on developing something within a few years that 
there was there was just no uh, little debate about the the need for uh, doing something like that, and so the the political will to to make that happen came about without even uh, the majority of the population knowing. Right. I, it seems like there's like a thread of distrust and authority um, now, you know, mm -hmm. um, and it can go all the way down to climate change, right? We're not going to even trust the experts. So, um, And there's a debate to be had about blindly trusting authority, but I feel like um, you're kind of hitting the nail on the head. I mean, if everything goes right, uh, we have a government that we trust that passes these laws and keeps us safe, you know, but... Um, I don't know if well, that's... if we took if we took the word government out of it because that's loaded, <laughs> and we and we said, well, let's let's over. design what would be the ideal situation here. We've got uh, a variety of risks along a spectrum from today to uh, a thousand years from now, uh, or unknown, and of of different levels of risk. What should we do about this? Uh, I've got things to do today that don't involve that. So I can't put all my attention on it, but I will acknowledge that it's a problem. So I would say, well, I would be willing to uh, give part of what I make to their, to, to people that are better at handling that than I am, who are, would like to do that. Seems like a, a good division of labor. And then let them do that and, and take care of that in the same way that I trust uh, airlines to make the plane I fly on safe, right. and 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 that uh, I will defer to their expertise. Now that's pretty much what a, a government ought to be doing. Um, and if we take the G word out of it, then <laughs> it, it 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 sounds a lot more reasonable. Right. I mean, one thing that seems clear is um, the difficulty in the bridge building. Um, you know. Elon Musk donated $10 million for AI, uh, for beneficial AI. And a lot of the work um, is being done is uh, influencing policymakers. Um, it could be, you know, influencing the companies that develop AI, right? So it's like, it seems essential not only to uh, fund these uh, organizations, but also to uh, have their influence and impact be measurable, right? And it, it does, and the $10 million is uh, impressive in terms of the uh, philanthropic range of, of donations that have been made. But if you think about what that pays for, that's, um, what, 30 people um, for a, a year, um, and it, it, it scales. It's not that many. Now they don't right. spend it on um, salaries. That money. Uh, I think this was the Future of Life Institute. Yes. Um, that 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 money mostly goes in grants, so it goes a lot further. But still, we we wouldn't be making the sort of dent that we'd like to, that I'd like to see in this, until that was ten billion dollars. Right. I mean, easily. It seems that. Um, and a lot of that comes from, like most issues, uh, education. So, yeah. Um, is there a subject that you're kind of um, really excited to get into? Is there something you've been itching to kind of say? or mm, um, Anything on the mind? Might be if I had thought about it long enough, but no, I've... Now, I, I do have another book coming out soon. I'm in the final draft phase of that at the moment. It's the same title as my podcast, Artificial Intelligence and You. And so I'm really trying to make that uh, accessible to uh, people. And I think the thing that um, I was, wanted to say about that was not so much the plug, but the uh, how fascinating it is to uh, try and and bring this to the the point where it's it makes the most sense to the most number of people right and 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 you can see how it will touch so many lives and yet the way that 
different people need to understand and learn about AI is is so radically different uh, that it, it is, I, I think, fascinating from a, a cultural standpoint to to see how this reaches out into so many different areas. And that is a sort of meta question about that is I, I think why? Why is it something that goes into so many areas? Like I, I tell people who are asking me if I do a talk, I could say, well, where do you want this pinned? Because I can go from <laughs> computer science to theology in 30 seconds. And and there's very little that it wouldn't have some kind of impact on. So we can discuss this as we have been doing in ranges of technology, military, economics, uh, philosophy, and uh, and society, uh, and psychology, and and the the list just goes on. And I think it's it's really interesting to think about why uh, are, are we taking it too far, or is it the consequence of this being something that can automate thinking, sort of the last bastion of human excep- exceptionalism. Right. I mean, um, there's kind of two directions I want to take that. Uh, for sure, it seems that the reason why is because we're talking about the operating system and all of the subjects seem to be all of the applications. I mean, they're all seemingly extensions of our uh, humanistic thinking, right? You know, psychology, economics, military, these are all human conceptions and creations. So I think we're more talking about the uh, the stem than the flower. Um, so that's why it's so fascinating because it, it does apply pretty much to everything. And um, that's why it sounds a little bit idealistic. We're going to cure cancer. We're going to do all these things. But it's within the range of things we think about and problems we need to solve. So um, I don't see, it's like a meta solution, you know? It seems to be uh, pulling the weeds out from the roots. And and I, I I like to try and think about that lower right corner, the Johari window, the yeah. uh, unknown unknown, which by definition you can't think about, but the, um, <laughs> the it, it is what, is AI going to be capable of when it, it, it exceeds us in certain parameters? It, it, it already goes past human ability in so many ways, but they're very narrow. Chess. Uh, of course, it's stuck. Yes. Uh, and, and chess was perhaps one of the first examples of something where we thought that it would take general intelligence to exceed human ability. Uh, and and it didn't, <clears throat> and, and but but now we we still don't have general artificial intelligence, but it it is creating this uh, uh, these breakthroughs in so many other narrow ways that was st- that are still ways that we thought that. AI would have to be general in order to do that in, in some of the sort of text manipulations and some answering questions. Like I can go to OpenAI and tell the the model there to make up a haiku about hedgehogs, and it will. <laughs> it will. And, and I, all I have to do is say, write a haiku about hedgehogs, and I will get one. Now, when I did that, it didn't have the right number of syllables, but it was close. So I don't want to be be picky about that. and. And now human cognition has limitations. We have, we, we can only think about a certain number of things at a time. Uh, it's George Miller's magic number, so-called. Uh, and that's, it's a small number, something like four. Um, and that that's, I, I, I can't language it properly, but it's about how many sort of different um <clears throat> quantities or or concepts can can we uh, hold in in our mind at this the, the same time simultaneously? Well, there's a limitation there of some kind. Um, and what if AI doesn't have that limitation? You can think about a million things at a time. Humans have to specialize. Uh, you hit that limit uh, of the number of things you can think about at 
the same time pretty fast yeah. if you're trying to write a paper uh, or or think about the advancement of some field. But if you had an AI that is uh, um, able to combine knowledge of fields like molecular biology, astrophysics, um, architecture, uh, multidimensional mm -hmm. mathematics, and, and it just, you know, the list goes on, but things that, that people can't combine in that kind of numbers, but it could combine thousands of them at once. Well, what's waiting in the intersection of those things that we haven't been able to contemplate before? That's in that unknown unknowns. Seems um, absolutely fascinating. It's one of the reasons why I got into the field is um, AI kind of as a creator. You know, what kind of art will AI make? You know, it's like uh, having a multidisciplinary expert in maybe a thousand subjects or more. Um, so that's definitely part of the exciting part of uh, what's going to happen as we do seem to have kind of this uh, ceiling for ourselves. I didn't know about the magic number. That's interesting. I'll have to look into that. Um, so, um, yeah, I mean, one really fascinating um, subject here is uh, I was thinking about towards the end of your book, you were talking about um, the scenario in the story about uh, kind of a oil and vinegar mix of uh, spiritual development and uh, scientific development, if I have that correct. Mm. Um, Good way of describing. Yeah, do you feel... This is probably, if I were to pick one subject to um, dive into professionally, this would be it. Um, how do you feel that the impact or strength of this crossover um, should exist um, will exist is a necessity. How do you feel that we're going to uh, need this uh, spiritual development into into technology, especially AI? I mean, as we were saying, um, you know, this is talking about thinking and our cognition and kind of the the base of our things that extend into everything. It seems like it's also a very existential um, question all the time. You know, a lot of the movies are, you know, it's about humanity's future, the survival of the race. Who are we? Are we, you know, uh, transhumanism, anthropomorphism, you know, all of these different things. It seems to cut to the core. You know, how do you feel about this um, spiritual incorporation into AI? I, I, I think AI is a mirror, um, but that many things are mirrors. And it's a question of, are you willing to look in the mirror? And so people like you and me look in that mirror and we go, wow, um, look at that. Now, I, I, I don't know to what extent people who aren't used to that sort of introspection and, and, and thinking philosoph philosophically right. um, will, will, will look at AI and, and draw the same kind of lessons from it that that we do and and think about the same kind of things so one would think not so much um but it provides another way of 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 getting through to uh people doing engage in the, this this journey of uh, living examined lives and it um so it it has that kind of uh, reflective quality uh, about it. And I think that we need to, well, we have the opportunity to look at those things before we get our noses rubbed in them, we, before the issues accelerate to the point where someone loses their job and that industry is automated, they can't get it back. Um, and they wonder, well, who am I if I'm not that that job, if a, if a machine is is doing that, it's the, the are they John Henry? Is, are they living that f fable now? Um, right. That that you and I and and others look at this and say, here is the the impetus for uh, examining our values to look at ourselves, to introspect, and 
And that's always a good thing, no matter what the, the cause. So let's take advantage of this opportunity to to do that. And, you know, everything will reach some group of people that other things didn't. So it has that that potential. A lot of people in computer science who were previously unmoved by things in philosophy, ethics, and now doing that. Right. And in, 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 in AI, find that they're going and knocking on the doors of philosophers and saying, we've got ethical problems. Have you thought about that? Because it's all new to us. Right. I mean... Um... Hiring ethicists in artificial intelligence labs has been has been the norm. It's pretty interesting. Yeah, um, yeah I mean, uh, as Sam Harris uh, kind of touched on this, you know, he said uh, we might be left just uh, throwing frisbees and giving massages to each other, you know, wondering <laughs> what to do. And you know, this is kind of aiming at this um, utopia that you're you're describing. Uh, I think there was um, a paper in Psychology about how. You know, uh, one town. I'm going to butcher this, but there was a town in um, in uh, ancient Greece, I believe, that you know everything was going beautifully, and they just screwed it up a little bit just to see what would happen. You know what I mean? Just to get something going. You know, we need a little bit of a juice in there, and it seems to be part of the human condition, um, mm-hmm. as you mentioned. Uh, but I wonder if this is going to be a push for us to do that examination. Uh, just as kind of, I, I don't know if you had this in your circles, but um, a lot of my friends, um, they were recent graduates, and uh, now most of them are in a different field than what they started in, which is, you know, surprising in the short term. It's not surprising in the long term, right? The average American changes their career or something like eight times. But a lot of people did this reflection in COVID and said, you know, what am I really doing? Why am I here? Why did I get this degree? And they're kind of detaching from their previous self and values into something that felt, at least to me, more authentic. You know, um, not happier, especially, but more authentic. And um, I have a theory that um, you know, with the advent of you know this um, overwhelming abundance that AI and AGI can create, you know, where you know, you might implement a universal basic income to supplement job loss or whatever solution that exists, if there's a solution, you know, it could make, it could clear up your time um, in order to have you fill the time with things that you want to do. Time with family, time being an artist, uh, doing the work you really want to do rather than out of, let's say, economic necessity. So that could create more authentic people and therefore create more authentic relationships. And I wonder if this can be um, a beautifully positive outcome. And, you know, I kind of looked at this through the value alignment problem as well. And I thought to myself, well, if we have sort of a global spiritual awakening, a kind of re-examination and unfolding, and we align our values um, to be more authentic to ourselves and with other people, it can, it can kind of gel the world together a little bit more. Um, but I've seen it. I've seen it happen on a local scale. Um, do you do you align with this? No pun intended. Do you feel that the um, the the space that AI creates can be filled in this way? Yes, I, I do. I, I think that we're at the other end of a cycle right now in, from spiritual awakening. That. We saw that in the 60s when the uh, boomers coming of age were exploring consciousness and um, taking all kinds of uh, trainings and uh, and experimenting with communal living and uh, and the whole idea of uh, reinventing your yourself ethically, philosophically, morally, was part of mainstream conversation. Right. Now, that's just, we're as far away from that as I think you can get. Uh, we'll return to it, but right now we're in the process of stopping the world from falling apart. And 
and, and so you have to kind of go with the flow uh, and, and anticipate that we will get back to that. But right now, we've we've got to address issues like and you you mentioned um, the what what could happen with AI and jobs and one of the issues I see right now is that automation is is happening right now but the benefits of that don't go to uh, aren't shared where you'd want that to so say McDonald's puts in an automated uh, touch screen kiosk for ordering things now they right. can say all they want that they're doing that to that they're not uh, doing that to uh, put the frontline staff out of business but there's just no other reason for doing it and 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 so that can show up in they just have fewer people taking orders or they move some of them to the back to to do things or they don't hire as many and so the the benefits of that, the return on the investment that they had to make in in creating those uh, kiosks and another uh, technology like there is now uh, AI for taking the order in the drive-through, listening to the the person saying that. Who paid for the investment? Well, it wasn't the employees of McDonald's. It was the um, stockholders and right. the uh, people with more interest in the company. So, of course, the return on that investment is going to go to them. What about the person that's now out of work uh, as a result? And this is where Bill Gates proposed a robot tax that the right. robot should, um, should, should be levied a, a tax according to what income tax the person whose job it displaced would have, have paid. But that's just... It's so unworkable. It, it, it's so rare that you would see, <clears throat> we're putting in this robot, You here's your pink slip. It doesn't fall out that way. They'll do something else, move them to the back uh, or uh, another job, or they'll just not hire. They'll just let att attrition take care of it. Now you right. can't say whose who's job is it that, that, that that's uh, displacing. Uh, who should get the the dividends of that tax uh, so the, the the capital flows from the people flows back to the dividends from this flows back to the people that had the capital to invest in the first place and and so this is an unstable uh, dynamic it, it, it goes the, the capital attracts more and more and the people who are uh, marginalized employment wise cannot get uh, the, the the kind of jobs um, that that would they would need with increasing frequency. Now that is a problem that uh, I think needs immediate uh, addressing, and yet it is really hard yeah. to solve. How do you do that without uh, changing capitalism? <laughs> and, you know, and and maybe it's a a matter of of taxation, but it's not simple. No, it's not. Um, I mean, <laughs> the the le the the effect of attrition is incredible, almost to the point of um, you forget its effect. Um, you know, nobody cares about blacksmiths anymore, really. You know, I mean, they're out of jobs except for select artisans. Um, and there's so many jobs that existed that will never exist because there's no need for them. Um, you know, some are of the party that if you can replace it, replace it. And uh, we'll put in some mechanism um, to kind of catch those who fall. Or, you know, I mean, the endless solutions, the windfall clause, value-added tax. Um, I think Andrew Yang tried to run on that too, um, mm. you know. Making, making the benefits for everybody. I really like that. Um, but you can mm. see in, in Japan, um, they, they understand uh, quality of life as well. I mean, they invent jobs in the government for the elderly. I mean, uh, I remember seeing when I was there, they have uh, you know, an elderly gentleman in one of those construction vests and he's pointing in the direction 
like to leave or to walk this way. It's it's a it's not a necessary job, but they do it for the well being of those who who want to get mm-hmm. up in the day and go to work and come home and say they saw something. And there's a quality there. Well, and I'd, I'd like to improve on that and and find something from them to do that is necessary. Uh, I'm not protectionist. I, I don't think that we should preserve jobs so that people have something to do. Otherwise, right. we would still be sweeping chimneys with children. <laughs> there, um, if if we can have a robot take an order at McDonald's, well, then that 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 is not likely. The sort of job that someone in first grade put on their bucket list. Um, neither is truck driving. Uh, it's right. inherently unhealthy. Uh, I know there's people who enjoy it, but no one should be forced into having that as their only choice. And yet, while we need human truck drivers, the system must ensure that there are people who have no better choice. And and there. Um, but but we haven't addressed this, this this question of if if someone's job is automated, then what do we what what is their next best choice? Right. Could, should working be a choice if it's if it's possible to make it a choice? And, and that's was certainly the prediction of the utopians. Uh, if you go back far enough, that we would have uh, the. Um, we would generate enough dividend from technology that no one would have to work. Right. And that's probably true now. It's just that that money isn't being distributed by our system in such a way to make that possible. And unless there's some sort of change, it will never be possible. I think it's more of like, um, you know, you're, you're a hardworking person that dreams of buying a modest house. You work hard and buy the house. And then you... Uh, you win the lottery, so uh, you start buying kayaks and motorcycles, and you know. You, so you have all these new projects that you now have to upkeep. You know, you have a sauna, you have to clean the sauna, and then it becomes this whole mess. And all of a sudden, there's so much work to do when you could have retired. Um, so it seems like, at least to me, it seems like society is like that. Like we've created all these open doors, no way of closing them, and now we got to keep the system going. So people, like you said in your book. Uh, we have karoshi, you know, we have like uh, this mm-hmm. feeling of like, oh my God, I have to work, I got to grind, there's so much to do. Where, you know, I mean, I remember reading about um, Hawaiian communities, they'd finish their work at 9 a.m., you know, mm-hmm. they would finish all their hunting and feeding and they would socialize for the rest of the day. Um, it doesn't seem out of line. I mean, I imagine a crossover where we kind of have this um, 60s commune, you know, uh, but it's all technologically um, supported, you know what I mean? Um, all the farming and stuff is automated and, you know, it seems it seems like a nice apex. I just don't know how we'll get there with the situations that we're in now. There should be room for uh, many different ways of participating in that. Right. Like someone like an Elon Musk doesn't have to work at all, but works more than right. 99.9% of the, the planet. Different um, different aim. He, he wants to because he's driven by something. And uh, on the other hand, you've got people that don't have to work because they're like trust fund babies or mm-hmm. uh, something and, and don't want to. Now, they're... So there's two people... Two sets of people hit there who are uh, able to exist comfortably with polar opposite um, work ethics or um, degrees to which they're, they're working. But in between, we've got people that we can't do that for. And it seems causing unnecessary friction problems. Yeah. Yeah. I definitely agree. I mean, it's from what I've read on world hunger, you know, uh, solving world hunger, it seems to be not a lack of resources. It seems to be, you know, kind of um, local wars, you know, um, kind of, you know, using it as leverage. 
um, things like that. And mm -hmm. I mean, I feel like it would be foolish to think we don't have enough food in the world. You know what I mean? So it seems like one of those Maslow's hierarchies can be fulfilled and it just isn't because of our, our seeming friction um, for unnecessary conflict. I think it's a distribution issue at... In, in, in one sense, I think there are statistics like you know, restaurants around the world throw away enough food every every day to feed everyone else. It's just the food is there. It's just in the wrong place. Yeah. Um, I wanted to ask maybe as a last question um, or second to last or whatever else. I'm curious of your thoughts of um, our raising of AI um, kind of back towards... Uh, values, um, you know, I've heard a lot of different analogies. A lot of people use that parent to child thing. Um, and one thing I recently read was about, you know, if we if we had our child um, map our exact values, that would be seen probably as a failure. It seems that generationally, um, kids kind of, uh, you know, dissect and then. Uh, ditch the ones that they don't like and we seem to improve our values over time possibly um, trying to take the good and improve do you feel that um, we're in an inherent contradiction where you know if we want an AI to align with our values as it is we don't seem to have our values set in order um, and you know that the more um, I can't say humanitarian but the more ethically um, morally right thing to do is to raise it as a child to explore the world, observe, and make its own conclusions. Um, do you think that this is uh, what we have to do? I mean, in terms of runaway AI, um, some argue that it's just, you know, uncontrollable, that we just can't control something smarter than us. But it, let's say that it is, in, uh, you know, a child that loves you or, or whatever else, you know, and the analogy do you feel that we should have this AI, AGI kind of explore its own and its conclusions might be better than ours, like a parent to a child? Mm, a well, I'd hope so. Uh, the, I think that the human to human value alignment problem, leave AI out of it, is the biggest one that ultimately we have to solve uh, or address. Uh, and and uh, Stuart Russell has an interesting solution to the value alignment problem that uh, I will try and describe, but it, it is to create AI so that it, it is aware of when it doesn't understand mm. what our values are. And that in a case like that, it will not pick something, but it will then say, I need to to learn more. I need to get better at this, but I'm not going to do anything until I uh, find something that, that makes more sense. And of course, if you can make sure that AI is developed that way, then then great. That doesn't rule out the possibility of someone somewhere developing it far less safely and that that becomes a, um, a runaway bad actor. Right. Uh, but, uh, but yes, you would like AI, uh, if it's going to become uh, super intelligent and if it's going to acquire superpower, you'd like it to be super compassionate, super ethical along with that. Some people think that's inevitable and obviously many mm. people don't think so because there is not necessarily a correlation between in intelligence and compassion. Benevolence, yeah. <laughs> right. Um, so it, it is a, a, a question. I, I think one of the more interesting ones here is that we're talking about a future where uh, of AI superintelligence where it has agency, it has self-awareness, it has consciousness, if you want to use a loaded term. Hmm. But these discussions are predicated on it being an independent actor of some kind. That's inherent to that is required by the uh your, your premise of it being a moral agent which obviously it is not right now mm -hmm. and so when we have these discussions in the present that element is, is missing it's all a tool it's an extension of us that we want to do 
the the right thing and not break in the process. What I am fascinated by is that at what point do we decide that it has crossed that line? Because that ask. boundary is is one that I don't hear discussed. How do you know? It's sort of like speed. You know when you're subsonic. You know when you're supersonic. Mm -hmm. But what is that transonic regime like for AI when it's – how do, will we have a test case? How will we decide this has gone from being uh, an extension of us, a tool in, in some sense, to being a, an independent moral agent? I mean, probably the most – fascinating question of the field right when does it have its own right. rights <laughs> i mean and, and it's not a matter of it passing the Turing test that that will happen much uh, much sooner. sooner absolutely i mean you know um you could be a solipsist and say that uh you know we're all chinese boxes you know or <laughs> chinese rooms you know and that like uh once it starts acting like one you have to treat it like one you know um, like I'll know it when I see it, like the heap of rice argument, right? Like that's not really, oh, there it is. That's a conscious being, you know? Um, but we'll there have to... Disagreements. There will be yeah. people who will say it's not conscious no matter what. Yeah. And then they'll go to jail for uh, murdering a moral agent, right? I don't know. That sounds like a great line of fiction. It does. Something to explore. Um... Any any call to action? Anything we should or do now? Explore anything that you feel is is a good thing for a, a listener to jump into. Uh, well, Besides I'm, your upcoming book, of course. Thank you. Um, I'm I'm very heartened by what I see uh, students uh, doing in this respect. I just interviewed uh, some on on the podcast who had started an organization called the Institute for Digital Humanity, and just the sheer level of energy in that organization was was crackling in, in what they were able to do. And all it took was one comment from a professor in one of their classes, hey, do you want to do something about this and such with robots? And they ran with it. It's entirely student run. So wow. uh, I, a, a, as a call to action, I would specifically like to call out uh, students and, and anyone else who's sitting here thinking, I want to do something about this, but it's just little old me. What? What? Is there a place that I can fit in and say, make your own place? They did. Um, if you're really not comfortable with making your own place, then go and join theirs or, or any of the other groups that are, are doing that. And, and there'll be a, a place for you to fit in. And, and a lot of people, I think, are in this position of yeah, I, I, there should be something I can do. The range of things that is is possible is is enormous as the impact of AI itself. So that, does that mean that they have to go, or do I have to give a TED talk? I don't think I'm up for that. No, um, it's <laughs> it's um, there are, 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 are so many things that it's as individual as you are, but um, that the. the if you haven't seen where that could be, then go talk talk with one of these groups like Institute for Digital Humanity or um, Center for the Study of Existential Risk. It depends on your uh, expertise and your interests, and 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 ask and, the, and and or just listen to what they're doing. Very well said, Peter Scott. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you very much. Awakened Episode 1 with guest Peter Scott, podcast host Vamir Ambartsomin, audio editor Richard Copier, music mix Simon Shkreli, voice announcer Gen Parton Shin. Awakened Episode 1 guest Peter Scott, podcast host Vamir Ambartsomin, audio editor Richard Copier, music mix Simon Shkreli, voice announcer Shin Geng.